Welcome to uh, ETSU's Department of Psychiatry Grand Rounds. I'm introducing Dr. Whitney Gilley. She's a native of Louisville, Kentucky, graduated from Bellarmine University in 2008 with a Bachelor's of Art in Biology and a minor in Philosophy with Applied Ethics Emphasis. It's very convenient. She's going to be talking to us about ethics today. She graduated from University of Louisville School of Medicine and completed the Rural Health Track in 2013. Dr. Gilley. Morning. Welcome. Thank you all for daring to come out to talk on this beautiful Friday morning on ethics. Okay, as far as disclosures, uh, my spouse did receive travel and conference uh, expenses from Neurom Pharmaceuticals. So we won't be talking about any pharmaceuticals today, and I don't have any personal uh, pharmaceutical relationships. So why talk about ethics? What is ethics? The dictionary definition is pretty simple. Ethics is the science or study of morality. But few people find the actual study this simple. Wittgenstein gave a metaphor as his best attempt to define ethics because it was for him something beyond words. He said, I can only express my feeling by the metaphor that if man could write a book on ethics, which was really a book on ethics, this book would, with an explosion, destroy all the other books in the world. For our purposes today, we can consider not only is ethics a study of conduct, but perhaps how to be a person. If we are to reject determinism, which states that there is no such thing as self-determination, free choice, or free will, then we have to consider the likelihood that we create ourselves through our actions. So what sort of person do we want to be? The purpose of this presentation today is to encourage self-examination self-examination of our own daily activities and the decisions we make under the light of our own principles. Zaniga's studies in epileptics and neuropsychiatric patients have shown that the left brain is very good at rapidly creating beliefs and then get, but then get reinforced and acquire emotional tags. These beliefs are hard to get rid of, but we can dilute them over time by looking at competing beliefs. When the left brain is confronted with information that doesn't conform to our beliefs, to our own self-image, its tendency is to create a belief to mesh the two, not self-examine to see what is really correct. You can therefore see how over time we can acquire a lot of these beliefs that lead to unexamined habit actions. These can have inadvertent consequences that can harm ourselves and often other people. But unless we self-examine and look at these habits, we will never be able to correct that mistake. Correcting distortions and dissonant actions not only helps us, but improves patient care. That is why we will focus on an area referred to as applied ethics. Ethics should not simply be an intellectual exercise. In the book, A Philosophical Disease, the risk of intellectualizing ethics is described. It says, the danger of bioethics as for moral philosophy as a whole is that of a widening gap between art and life still further, of inventing creatures who live only in the pages of philosophy textbooks and medical journals and whose world bears little resemblance to the world we actually inhabit. The key to applying ethics to the real world is self-examination so that we can reteach the brain when needed. All human beings carry about a set of words which they employ to justify their actions, their beliefs, and their lives. It's okay to be wrong sometimes, but if we aren't examining our beliefs, we will make habits of repeating our mistakes. If you feel upset about something presented today, ask yourself why. Using this technique to investigate the source of discomfort will help you to determine what your values are and whether your actions align with this. Benefits being having and practicing medicine with a clear conscience and patients are more likely to respect you. Sometimes we use external constructs to determine what morality is, and that's okay. However, it is strongly recommended 
that we examine any principle or law before assuming it's what we want. We know that historically the law can be wrong, and we should never simply assume that what is lawful is ethical. Another risk is that what when what is referred to as blind faith is used in regards to ethical principles. Oftentimes people who examine these principles, whether they are commandments or precepts, find that they become easier to keep. If we understand why there's a rule, there's no accidentally transgressing. Many people find that examination of such principles actually strengthens their conviction. So let's begin by looking at how do we develop our moral reasoning. Piaget did some pioneering work in the 1930s that looked at children's development of moral judgment. He identified two broad stages based upon children's responses to short stories. The first stage, heteronymous morality, occurs in five to 10 year olds. They see the rules as being handed down by authority and that these are immutable, not changeable. They focus on outcomes, not intent. As an example, the child would be given uh, two of the following scenarios. A little boy who's called John is in his room. He goes into the dining room, but behind the door there was a chair, and on the chair was a tray with 15 cups on it. John could not have known that there were 15 cups behind the door. He goes in, the door knocks against the tray, and all 15 cups get broken. That's the first scenario they'd be given. And then they're given the second one. Once there was a little boy whose name was Henry. One day his mother was out. He tried to get some jam out of the cupboard. He climbed up on a chair and stretched out his arm. But the jam was too high up and he couldn't reach it. But while he was trying to get it, he knocked over a cup. The cup fell down and broke. The children were then asked, who was naughtier? In the heteronymous stage, they would universally respond, John, because he broke more cups, unable to discern the intent. In the second group, the autonomous stage, the children are able to incorporate intent into their judgment and have moral reciprocity, reciprocity the golden rule. So they do unto others as you would have done do unto you. They understand that rules may not apply to all circumstances and can be changed. There are some difficulties with PJ stages as they can underestimate childhood moral capacities. Kohlberg created a more comprehensive theory and hopefully everyone here is uh, familiar with the Heinz Dilemma, um, but I would you like to, you to take a few minutes and read this and kind of start thinking about how you would respond in this situation. On this slide, we see Heinz is unable to afford the inflated cost of a drug to save his wife's life. So Heinz must choose whether to steal the drug to save her life. The important thing is not so much what you think he should do, but your reasoning as to why he should do or not do it. Based on responses to this dilemma, Kohlberg was able to create six groups or stages that fit into three hierarchical levels that represent moral development. The first level begins in early childhood and looks at morality as something external. Stage one is very concerned about who's going to get in trouble. And if you've ever you know, talked with small children, this is a big concern of theirs. They do not see other people's point of view very well. When they reach stage two, they start to appreciate other points of view, but are still very egoistic. You can almost think of it as in uh, what's in it for Heinz. We may even have met some adults that uh, still think this way. The second level usually begins in middle childhood and focuses on maintaining relationships and societal order. It is important to note that most adults will stay at this level. So within it, we have stage three, which is the good boy, good girl, self-identity. Um, one worries about 
how others will see them. You want to have moral behavior that helps others and is socially approved. They try to follow the golden rule at this stage. Stage four believes that morality is showing respect for authority. It's the law and that's why you do it. Less than 20% of adults reach level three, wherein morality becomes principle based and may have universality. For those that reach these stages, it is thought to begin in mid-adolescence at the earliest. These are people who are willing to do the difficult and popular thing at times in order to uphold these principles. They are no longer locked into seeing societal rules as innately possessing a high level of morality. Of note, there really weren't many responses against time stealing the drug at this stage because the good of saving a life is viewed as a higher good than not stealing. Stage five shows the emergence of social contract orientation, which recognizes that laws and rules are flexible so far as it furthers human needs in a fair way. They can construct alternatives to current laws and structure. If the laws are consistent with both common good and individual rights, they are to be followed. Stage six becomes focused on universal ethical principles. Moral action is determined by individuals chosen set of principles valid for all humans regardless of external rules. So how do we get to these stages? Can we influence where we get to? We know that children with attentive, engaged parents that question and really listen to their children and then give high level reasoning tend to develop further. Interacting with peers also exposes us to different challenging viewpoints. So close friendships and socialization early on is very helpful. Industrialized societies show tendency towards higher levels of Kohlberg stages and faster overall development. Individuals in village societies rarely progress beyond stage three. It's thought to be due to the heavy dependency on direct relations in these societies which does not favor looking at larger social institutions. Educational level has also been shown to play a role in developing to stage four or higher. Taking college classes that emphasize open-ended discussion and exposure to social diversity, so different viewpoints, also promotes advancement. So what about medical education? There's often an assumption that medical education helps develop the ability to make high-level ethical decisions in the face of change, chaos, and immense responsibility. This may not be the case. Estimates for medical students and physicians achieving stage three in Kohlberg's hierarchy is not thought to be much better than the general population, about maybe 30% instead of 20. Some studies are showing that medical education may be inhibiting advancement in moral reasoning. Murrell describes an outright failure of medical education worldwide to make changes to impact the moral judgment of its students. 165 U.S. medical students at the University of Tennessee College of Medicine were given a standardized exam that assessed current stage of moral judgment as well as percentage of post-conventional reasoning, so where they fell in this hierarchy. Variables include your in school and whether the student had participated in a professionalism course. And that's important to note, it was not an ethics course, it was on professionalism. Essentially, there was no difference between any of these groups. So despite some attempts to teach moral reasoning, as well as increasing levels of clinical exposure, these students didn't really progress in the moral reasoning like we might expect. Another study done in Canada looked at 54 medical students over the course of three years, beginning with their first year of medical school. 72% of the students remained in their same stage. 13% actually dropped a stage. And 15% progressed to a higher stage. The overall mean weighted score actually showed a decline in moral development. However, the overall mean change in stage was not significant. So a mean of 3.46 in year one and 3.84 in year three. And of note, this is stage, not the level. Overall, there have been some conflicting studies from earlier in the 1990s that showed improvements using similar methods. 
Most studies, including one by the same investigator, showed no improvement in moral reasoning among U.S. medical students. We saw earlier that increasing educational level is associated with improved moral reasoning. So what's different about medical education? It may be that the traditional hierarchical and at times paternalistic structure in medicine is often not conducive to open discussion of such issues. So conceivably this may be a factor. However, if that were the only reason, we should see improvement as our education system moves more and more away from this. The studies we have read don't seem to show this. In 1985, the LCME created a requirement for medical colleges to include ethics, behavioral, and socioeconomic topics related to medical practice. This has never been standardized. Fewer than half of AAMC colleges teach ethics as a directed curriculum, though others, as we saw with the University of Tennessee, maybe incorporating this into other curriculums such as professionalism. An important thing to note is that professionalism and ethics are not necessarily the same thing. Professionalism refers to a particular set of knowledge or standards that apply to a particular profession. Often includes an ethical framework, but you can consider it without it. There's also even the possibility that at times, ethical behavior may not align with standard perceptions of professionalism, especially if adhering to principles goes against generally accepted norms. Independent of profession, it has been shown that students who take courses that focus just on ethics, so really directed courses, either discussion or practice, are more likely to have improvement in moral judgment. Courses that have a sublimated ethics curriculum did not create the same level of benefit as the directed ethics courses did. One of the issues with having ethics sort of worked into other courses is that over-reliance on case studies for the sake of time. Case studies really are impractical without having some background in social or ethical philosophy. The case studies themselves are generalized, impersonal, and written from the view of a dispassionate observer. That's not the role most of us have when ethical issues arise in our practice. To have benefit, you need repeated exposure to these types of studies in conjunction with in-depth discussion. Case studies are usually designed to teach one main point, but that doesn't tell us how to discern what's actually important in the real world scenario. That is the skill that's often the bigger challenge in real life. So, Medical ethics itself is the study of moral values and judgments as applied to decisions and actions within the medical field. In medical education, we usually encounter the four non-hierarchical principles, meaning that one is not better than the other, of beneficence, essentially doing good for the patient, non-malfeasance, not doing harm, autonomy, respecting the patient's say in what happens to them, and justice, equanimity in who and how you treat. These principles are widely taught as the way to approach ethical issues in medicine. Gillian states that the principle-driven approach claims that whatever your personal philosophy, politics, religion, moral theory, or life stance, you will find no difficulty committing yourself to the four principles. However, not everyone agrees that this is the way to teach medical ethics. Opposition to the four non-hierarchical principles comes from the concern that these principles are not based in any unified theory and therefore appear somewhat random. Maybe there are more principles, maybe there are less. It could be considered also premature to introduce a subset of ethics without examining the underlying principles that come into play. There are multiple ethical theories used to determine morality and moral action. These views often come into contact conflict. Briefly, there is the classical virtue ethics, where your morality is based on your character. You either have it or you don't. It's not very useful if you're looking for self-improvement. There's moral relativism, which depends on a set of environmental factors. But if it were true, we may never know it. Often cultural relativism is viewed as a self-defeating principle. 
It was created in the culture of Western white male academia and may only be applicable there. Consequentialism or teleology is a major branch that focuses on consequences of action as a guide for making moral judgments. Egoism looks at what's good for the individual. Its close cousin hedonism uses a method called hedonic calculus to actually calculate how much pleasure one would get out of an action and then that's how you decide what to do. Hopefully this is not how doctors are making decisions. Utilitarianism, also within this branch, is a bit different as it looks at some total happiness for the group or community. And we'll talk about this a little more in the next slide. Deontology, its major competitor, is also one that we will touch on. So you can think of the mantra of utilitarianism as do what creates the most good for the most people. If you're interested, check out John Stuart Mill, who is closely associated with utilitarianism. Essentially how this works is that when an ethical dilemma arises, the utilitarian evaluates alternative options and predicts the consequences of each action. The amount of happiness generated for all involved individuals is assessed. The action that produces the most good for the group is then chosen. Of course, there's problems with this method. This cartoon sums up very well one of the problems that we see. It says, ethics gets weird when you try to account for results. And on the paper it says, lives saved by Batman equals B. Therefore, lives saved by the people who killed Batman's parents is B minus 2. So the major competing ethical theory, deontology, looks to do what is the morally correct action in of itself. So despite the outcome, killing Batman's parents would be considered the wrong thing to do. Associated philosophers are Immanuel Kant and Thomas Aquinas. To get a good grasp of underlying principles in deontology would probably take most of this hour. So we're just going to kind of have an overview here today. You begin with the ethical problem and compare alternatives with your ethical principles. There are three possibilities that happen. One alternative is consistent with that principle, so that's the easy, obvious choice. Sometimes you have several good choices, so they're all consistent. Often, an alternative is consistent with one principle, but comes into conflict with another. You then have to weigh if the consistent principle is of a higher priority within your hierarchy. If so, the other principle may be violated. If not, there's really no mechanism with deontology to address it. You're kind of on your own. A famous allegory is sometimes used to teach the difference between these two. Um, and it highlights um, deontology and utilitarianism. There is a city where everyone is happy. Life is pleasant and easy. There is no suffering. However, everyone who lives in this city, when they turn 18, has to go to an isolated house and go down into the basement and see what's there. They'll see a child chained to the wall. Some of the people who see this walk away from the happy city, never to return. These are examples of deontologists. Even if we don't have complex theory guiding our ethical decision making, we can still investigate our own principles to better think clearly about our actions and our ethics. This is becoming increasingly challenging and important as the practice of psychiatry changes. The field of medicine as a whole has continued to change. In Do We Still Need Doctors, which is an excellent book, um, talks about how medicine has become more technical over time. Um, Lantos asserts that modern medicine is a profession driven by science, technology, and reductionist ethics and entitlement economics, rigorously scientific and dogmatically closed-minded. The changes we have seen in the past few decades have come about because of attempts to balance limited resources with ever-increasing financial pressures. New drugs are expensive, and we want to offer the newest and supposedly best treatment to our patients. Defensive medicine has become the norm, and reimbursement for physicians has become less clear-cut. These pressures can affect what is emphasized in patient care, and this is often not for patient benefit. 
McIntyre noted that even prior to managed care, that the medical encounter had acquired the marks of bureaucracy with forms, applications, receptionists, and waiting rooms. This increases patients' feeling of powerlessness and dependency, which are often already forefront when facing any major illness. The barriers of bureaucracy may increase patients' perception of the doctor's infallibility, which can get us into trouble later on. Impersonality is cultivated when one physician is treated as just as good as any other. This is very disturbing for many patients, especially in a field like psychiatry. Do you really want to recount your painful emotions or trauma to a strange and different provider every time you come? Many of us have encountered the recent trend towards high throughput medicine, which is high volume and low patient care time as an attempt at medical efficiency. This has happened from time to time in the past due to necessity in other fields of medicine. It seems to be a relatively new trend in the field of psychiatry. Higher caseloads lend to heavier requirements for paperwork, Though in the medical legal as well as reimbursement realm, the quality requirements have not really changed. On average, one-sixth of U.S. physicians working hours are now spent doing paperwork. More worrisome is the effect of performance-based pay on the patient encounter, because even oncologists, who we often view as being by necessity fairly compassionate people, cutting visits shorter and squeezing in more patients in response to this trend. We have to wonder how patients facing such a huge life crisis as cancer feel about this. We know that high throughput attempts at efficiency don't always work out well for patients. This recent report in the BMJ made headlines across the country with the finding that medical errors may now be as much as the third leading cause of death in the United States. Apart from medical errors, we encounter many other difficulties with this new style of medicine. There is often fragmentation of care with patients being interchanged among different providers as we had discussed. Brief visits can lead to failure to form a therapeutic alliance. Patients are then more likely to mistrust you as well as the system and are overall less satisfied. We no longer have the time to initiate workup for things that traditionally psychiatrists might have. For example, referring patient to their primary care doctor if there's concern about liver or thyroid issues and the need for testing, which can lead to unnecessary delays in treatment. Less time often leads to poor communication between providers, which can endanger patients. Physicians are much more likely to experience burnout in these systems, given the feeling of being overwhelmed with menial tasks, loss of patient connection, and feeling that they are not able to help their patients as much as they would like. The push for high throughput medicine has led some mental health systems to set 15 minute visits with psychiatrists in outpatient settings. Obviously the focus of these visits is medication, but are we really wanting to assume a simple technician's role? What kind of connection can we make with that patient in such a short time when we know the therapeutic alliance is so important for patient outcome? How has our field allowed for this to become so common? Is there fear of getting attached to patients? Or is it more financially motivated with the decision being to sacrifice that therapeutic connection in exchange? Reimbursement for hospitalizations are often limited, even if the patient is not safe enough to go home. Therapy reimbursement has also slowly ebbed away, which for some patients is actually a better option than medication. Mental health treatment was often an add-on to insurance. So many patients have faced personal financial barriers to receiving treatment. The Affordable Care Act has set a goal to change this, but it's still unclear if this will be effective given continued provider shortages, most notable in our own region. So what do we do? Even if we are still unsure about our own principles, a good foundation for ethical behavior can always begin with compassion. Of course, kindness towards others begins with ourselves. Just like an empty well has nothing to give, if we don't take care of our own basic needs, we won't do a very good job taking care of other people. Sometimes as physicians, we forget about this. Be sure you're sleeping, eating, and creating some time and space for yourself. One way to cultivate compassion is to constantly reassess how we look at other people. Other people will teach you a lot about yourself. When a patient comes late, at the end of the day, do you feel annoyed or do you feel concerned about why they're late? What kind of challenges led them to be late? Not an easy thing to do. 
When a difficult patient comes into your office, let's say an angry, demanding patient, ask yourself, what are they really saying to you? And it may not even be in their words. We can think much more clearly about how to deal with other people when we can see the burden they're carrying. As physicians, our position is inherently perceived as one of power. Because of this, we should consider how we use our language. There has been a trend where the term client has snuck into psychiatry. It may be completely appropriate for a therapist or social worker to be using this term. But we should consider whether this is an appropriate term for a physician to be using. Because it is denoting a sort of business transaction. Maybe I'm alone in this, but I know I would feel more than a little uncomfortable laying in a cath lab and hear the doctor referring to me as a client. You just don't see this done in other specialties, except maybe plastic surgery. So should psychiatrists who are doing something as intimate as changing brain chemistry, the part of us many people see as the seat of their being, be talking about patients in terms of clients? Is the image we want to create one of impersonally doing business? Another perhaps more commonly encountered term is that a prescriber. This term sets up expectations on the part of the patient that in that upcoming visit, the purpose of the encounter and the only purpose is script writing. Use of this term up front also could represent a lie of omission. Does the patient have a right to know who is treating them beforehand? If they don't want to see a nurse practitioner, that's an option for the patient. But I think being clear about availability of the MD is quite appropriate. If they want to wait an extra two months, that's called patient autonomy. To really understand whether we act in accordance with our principles, we need to look at our habit actions. So what are those? Think about how much active thought there is in the day in brushing our teeth or putting on our shoes, not a lot. Now think about how your casual interactions are between staff or patients. We often don't think much about these routine behaviors because we do it so much so often. Does your demeanor reflect someone people should be afraid of? Are you approachable? How about the way we structure interviews? Do patients get to say what they feel they need to say to you, or are we watching the clock? Are we actually present with the patient in the room, even if that's not a pleasant thing, or are we thinking about what's for lunch? And these are difficult, difficult things to do. That's why we have to continuously look at our behaviors. The more we notice these things, the more informed we are about whether these actions are consistent with our values and the person we want to be. We have to also consider the environment we're in. Say you've been looking at your speech and actions, but find yourself repeatedly in situations that make doing the right thing difficult. It's not an excuse not to do the right thing. And if ethical behavior is your goal, thinking that's just how it is, will not help you get that. This can be hard, especially in situations where you're not in charge. The reality is that we have to be wise about when and how change can be enacted in ethically challenged environments. Using moral courage judiciously is something we see at the highest level of Kohlberg stages of moral development and something to which we can aspire. Ideally, you want to align yourself with an environment that is at least somewhat conducive to your values. Reflect on how you felt practicing in high throughput environments versus other settings. Set boundaries early on. When it comes to going to work somewhere, it helps to be clear up front about what is and isn't okay. If you don't want to do new intakes in 40 minutes, make that clear. Many places will, will accommodate you. If you have a position of power, use it to cultivate an environment that rewards honest communication through mutual respect of coworkers and staff. They see our blind spots and can help us make positive changes if we let them. This in turn will create an environment where ethical challenges can be openly addressed instead of hidden or ignored out of fear. The overall work environment is improved and no surprise, happier people are more efficient. If you find you're in a position that really is incompatible with your principles, you might have to consider leaving that environment. That might mean moving or taking lower pay somewhere else. It just depends on what your value judgments are and what's really important in life for you. So to summarize, 
In order to generate ethical behavior and practice, we should continuously monitor ourselves, looking at our beliefs and behaviors to help teach our brain to recognize and correct harmful habit actions. So I have a couple cases. These are a little bit different than cases you probably encountered before um, in like ethics courses. These are geared more towards working on basic like real life uh, mundane issues, but they can still be challenging. So case one, you're working at a local private practice clinic that maintains a policy that the patient will be dismissed from the practice with more than two no-shows or patient-initiated cancellations in a year. One of your patients treated for severe major depressive disorder has had two no-shows and called to cancel tomorrow's appointment. The patient is informed by the clinic staff that if she cancels, she will need to find another provider. In tears, the patient states she has been struggling to make the copay because of the timing of the appointment in relation to payday. The receptionist asks what you would like to do. So does anybody have any thoughts? And we're not even looking, you know, so much for right or wrong answer here. I don't, I don't think that's necessarily um, something we have. But sort of um, what are your thoughts and how do you go about making a decision in a case like this? And if you need a minute to think about it, that's okay. So she tells you that... Um, a lot of times because of clinic availability, the appointments are falling prior to her payday. So she's unable to make the copay. And, you know, even in something it seems as simple as this that we might encounter on any given day, we see that competing goods. So here we have livelihood, financial issues, and beneficence, you know, concern for the patient. And, um, you know, even if you're using, for example, a utilitarian approach, they may even say, you know, under that ethical principle, you should just charge this patient because this patient is taking up spots someone else needs. The ontologist would counter, you know, we have to consider the individual circumstances. It's a must. Any other thoughts?
Okay. I think we've got time for one more. So case two, you have a new insured patient presenting to your office with complaint of anxiety. Patients, they say, have been, they're needing to benzodiazepines, and they recently moved from out of state bring their records that show they are on high dose for many years. Do you prescribe? And just to make it more complicated, even throwing the issue of is rapport important in this situation?
<laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. All right, so I want to thank Dr. Martha Burns for all her help with today's presentation and also to my very patient husband for listening to my practicing many times. <laughs> Sure. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if that's much better. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm.